Emmy, who's the heroine in our story, she has a childhood friend, a young man by the name of Rudy, and they've grown up together. And as Emmy's coming of age and growing, and um, she's developing feelings for Rudy, but it's awkward and it's weird. So this is just kind of a passage about um, an interaction that she has with Rudy. Okay? Um, it says, after the goodbyes were said, Emmy gathered water from the pump in the kitchen. She brushed her teeth and she washed her face. She changed into her gown and then snuggled under the covers. Sleep wouldn't come. Her thoughts were racing like the moonshine cars that her brother drove. Her initial thoughts were of Rudy. True to his word, he had stopped by early in the evening. He'd eaten an extremely large piece of apple pie. She had pondered when Rudy was eating, who could eat that much pie in one setting? After Rudy ate, he complimented Emmy on its goodness. Rudy had winked at her when Auntie wasn't looking and had whispered darling in her ear, which she found very unnerving. Who knew that blowing a kiss would have this effect, she thought. Lord, please have my mercy on me, she prayed. That was part of her that wanted to laugh and a part of her that wanted to cry. She wanted to understand the change in her friend. Maybe if the wind carried her kiss to Rudy, it would carry it right back and return things to the way they were. She also thought about her brother discussing the love bite. What did the bite of love entail? Was it a gentle nibble or did it draw blood? Or maybe it was both. Next, her mind traveled to the snake handlers that had visited Big Creek Church last summer. The congregation was mesmerized by the two men who picked up rattlers and wrapped them around their necks and limbs. Neither of the men were bitten by the venomous snakes. Auntie had said it was plum foolishness and that God's people shouldn't test their maker. Emmy wasn't sure about the snake handlers, whether their actions were foolish or not. She just wanted to understand what it meant to be bitten by love. That night, with Emmy's puppy by her side, she dreamt about Rudy. He was standing in Auntie's garden, eating the biggest piece of apple pie imaginable. A small garter snake was crawling around his feet. Rudy picked up the snake, examined it closely, and with a big smile on his face, put it in his overall pocket. Ah, awesome. Very well done. That's good. Well, thank you. Yeah. Welcome to episode number 36 of Halfway There. You've found what I like to call the way station of the spiritual journey. It's a place to stop, put your feet up, take your shoes off, hear a story, and get a little bit of rest. This is Halfway There, where we have honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience. My name is Eric Nevins. You can find show notes and links to everything that we talk about here today, including the book. Today I have the author of a book called The Whispering of the Willows, and she's going to share her story with us. You're, you might want to check this out. Um, I think you will enjoy the book. Her Way with Words is really great. In fact, you heard there at the beginning the just a little snippet of the book. And if you like that, you can get Whispering of the Willows. You can go to ericnevins.com, click on the link for this episode, episode number 36. And there's a, there's a link in there to get to um, over to Amazon and to order the book, or you just go to Amazon and you can get it there. Uh, if you use the link on the show notes page, it's an Amazon affiliate link, and that does send a little something back my way just so you are aware. Well, today um, we had a really great conversation um, with my guest. Um, Really interesting, the way that the Lord has taken her from, um, you know, where where she started out to, through a process over many years of being ready to serve in the way that she is currently serving 
uh, different people in South Africa. So she shares all of that with us, and I can't wait for you to hear it. Here's my conversation with Tanya Jewel Blessing. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Eric. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Oh, it's great to be here with you. Great. Well, I'm excited to hear your story. We just met a few minutes ago, but this will be, this will be good to get to know each other a little bit. Yeah, I'm excited. Everyone has a story. And I think um, the Bible is filled with stories that inspire us oh, yeah. in our walk with God. And even today, Christians have stories. And those in stories should inspire others to press forward in their faith. Oh, yeah. I so agree. That's exactly why I do this show. Um, I think there's so much that we have to offer and encourage each other with that um, we don't always get a chance to in the way that, that church does unless you're in a small group. So That's true. We're, we're podcasting it instead. <laughs> um, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and then we'll go back and I'll, I'll ask you a few questions about how you got here. Sounds great. Um, my husband and I have been married for thirty, almost 35 years. Wow. So my husband retired from working for the city and county of Denver, and I have spent most of my adult life either working on staff at churches or teaching school. And when my husband retired, we were currently operating a retreat facility for missionaries. And my husband felt so strongly that we were called to go to South Africa. And I wish I could say it was one of those wives that got right on board, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to go, bring it on. But that wasn't me. And I just had a great experience at church one Sunday. I was sitting in the middle of worship and God began to speak to me. Wow. That if I loved missionaries, if I loved people that he called to serve cross-culturally, why wouldn't I go to where those people are? And within the next year, we moved, we relocated to South Africa. We've been there for about five years. Wow. We are having the time of our life. You know, serving God should just be so much fun. I mean, there are disciplines involved, <laughs> obedience involved, but there should be such joy in fulfilling what God's called us to do. Yeah, well, I can see just all of your face is that joy that you're excited well, about you. it, and that's that's cool. So interesting. I'll look forward to hearing a little bit more about that um, as we go here. Okay. Uh, so you grew up in Denver, or did you just no, live here in Denver? No, I, I I grew up in the Midwest. Grew up in Ohio. Okay. Um, my parents were both from the Appalachian Mountains, and they were the first of their families to finish edu uh, high school education. They moved because uh, uh, West Virginia was so impoverished. And the first in their family to own a home and to build a life, to send their kids to college. Wow. And so I met Chris. I was working for a televangelist, an old-time oh, cool. televangelist by the name of Rex Humbard. And Chris's um, aunt worked there, so she introduced us. So when I met my husband, he was finishing college here in Denver, and that's how I ended up here. Gotcha. All right. Well, so how did you meet Christ then? All right. I actually can vividly remember being between three and four years old, okay. sitting in a Baptist church on a Wednesday night, and they had a class called Eager Beavers. <laughs> I, I can remember it. And the teacher... You, okay, there's so many thoughts going through I my head. I know it. Thank but okay. Yeah, really. But anyway, I, I remember specifically the teacher asking, is there someone here who wants to ask Jesus into their heart? I remember raising my little hand. And um, I don't know, it's still vivid. I can tell you and describe what the room looked like and what the teacher looked like. So I accepted Christ as a very young, young child. Yeah. And then in high school, um, I just recommitted all of that to the Lord and traveled with a drama group and did ministry. Went to work for the, you know, a ministry. Spent most of my life in ministry, so just exciting. Wow, that's great. So tell me about how did that really become your own? How did your faith become your own? You know, I don't think at three year old, three years old, sure. your faith is your own. I, I, it took really until high school, and yeah. actually later in high school, for for me to find faith that wasn't shadowed by somebody else's faith. Mm. And that's the natural progress of yeah. things, you know, with parents or church leaders. When, when children are young, it's almost like they step into the shadows of that person's faith. 
And there becomes a time where they have to come out of the shadows. And so it was probably maybe a sophomore in high school before I realized, okay, this isn't about my parents' faith or about a pastor's faith or a church. This is about me having a relationship with God. Yeah. And, and my relationship with God can't be dependent on somebody else. It has to be dependent on me. Yeah. So what did you do with that? How did you, how did you make that your own? I think um, I made it my own, I think, through prayer and study of God's Word. I, I was just very passionate about understanding God. Mm. And so I think prayer and study did that, even more than church services, you know, just yeah. that alone time with God at a, at a closet, a walk-in closet in my bedroom at, at my parents' home. And I would go in there and sit. I mean, I would turn the lights off and just sit. Uh -huh. And I mean, I can't sing a tune, my husband will tell you. <laughs> but I would sit in that closet and I would sing and I would pray and hide myself away with God. And it just built an inner strength that even as a young woman, I was just confident in who, who God created me to be. Well, wow, that's that's a really neat story. That's interesting Thank you. That, that you did that. So how? So you went, you graduated then? What, where'd you where you go from there? Um, you know, I, I, I after school I started working for this ministry. I, I worked in their counseling department, um, and my job was basically I answered letters from people who were struggling in their walk with God. And oh, I bet that was interesting. That was very interesting. You know, I'm young in my 20s, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've never even heard of this. Yeah. But it, it was great. They, they, the, the, the organization was set up, so there was a lot of mentoring and a lot of help connected with that. And um, I actually began to do some writing at that point, um, met my husband, and life just took a whole different direction. So when I first married my husband... Um, he was working as a police officer, and we lived way up in the mountains, which was a whole culture shock. Yeah, it's different up there. It is different up there. Um, but I think, looking back, God orchestrated some of that stuff to prepare us for where we are today. He does that in all of our lives. So living in, in an isolated area, learning to just yeah. you know, press in with, with God and understand what was going on just was a part of my life from early on. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so take us through through that. Did, I'm trying to. I want to hear more about your journey. So tell okay. me about your, your journey with God. How did that? Um, where did you have? So you had some of the knowledge pieces and prayer pieces as as high the high schooler. Mm -hmm. So as you got married, you know, did what did God? Oh. You know, how did how did He develop that relationship with you? Um, I think one of the things that happened is. When my husband asked me to marry him, um, he comes from a missionary family, and he told me, you know, Tanya, God has called me to help missionaries. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I love you, but I love God more. And I have to know, I'm sorry, I'm choking up here. No, that's great. I have to know that I'm marrying someone who will walk that with me. And I, I love my husband so much that my response was, I'll do it. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm crying, but... It's okay. I'm sorry I made you cry. I, that's okay. And I would say we've been married maybe just a few months. And my husband began inviting people to our home. Wow. And one of the couples that he invited to our home were a missionary couple. And they were here in Denver doing ministry and they were living out on east colfax in just a dive hotel yeah which is not a nice area never. it's not a nice area they were just trying to serve god and had no money and they came to our home for dinner and i remember we had leftovers and we packed the leftovers for them to take back to their hotel yeah. and the woman crying and i was hooked i told wow. my husband i'll do whatever we can do to help people in their service for god and so that started me on a journey of just learning how to partner with my husband in ministry, learning how to serve people in ministry, recognizing that ministry wasn't just about standing in a pulpit and preaching. It was about coming alongside of people and, and helping people. And 
And in that, you've got to, as Christians, the Bible says we grow in discernment. I had to grow in understanding those things. I had to begin to, those little nudges of the Holy Spirit, I had to begin to recognize those and, and act on them and squash down fear and become bold. Yeah. And that was a process for me. It's a process for all of us. Right. But I just got hooked on, God, I love you. And you love people, so therefore I love people. Yeah. And how I help them is just however you direct me to help them. So. Oh, that's great. How do you have any stories about how, or like, when God did nudge you to to help somebody, and you and you followed it, or maybe I you do. didn't? No, I, I mean I do. I do have stories about following and stories about not following. But, um. I was sitting in a restaurant one time, and um, I knew that I needed to talk to this man. And I said to my husband, Chris, I think God wants you to go talk to this man. <laughs> and my husband is a, a sweetheart, and he says, you tell me, if God is asking you to talk to this man, then you talk to him, and not me. God's not directing me to talk to this man. <laughs> That's good discernment on his part. Uh, yeah. Good discernment. <laughs> so anyway, I went, I went over to the man, and I said, you know, I, I, I know this is weird, but I'm a Christian, and I just feel like God wants me to give you a word of encouragement. I just thought the Lord wants me to tell you that he loves you, he's seen what you've been through, and he's bringing you out on the other side. And the man had been battling cancer. Wow. Just gotten a report from his doctor that cancer was in remission. And he had hope that he hadn't had for a while. And it was just confirmation to him that God saw this, yeah. saw how difficult this was. And he is bringing you out on the other side. And you know, I think that God wants to do that in each one of our lives. He puts people across our paths. I was in um, Office Next the other day, and this woman standing next to me, and she has a picture of, of a, a young man, a, a handsome young man. I said, oh, you know, this, this young man is just so attractive. Is he your son? The woman begins to cry. She just lost her husband. Um, the picture that she had was of, of her son, and he was adopted. And there was just a mix-up with the adoption that she couldn't get sorted out because of her husband's death. And those are God moments that we recognize. And we have to be bold enough to say, you know, this is a God moment. So now I'm going to pray for this woman. I'm going to encourage her. I'm going to tell her I'm going to continue praying for her and stand with her in her journey. Oh, that's great. That's, it's amazing when God does use us in those ways, mm -hmm. too. And um, I'm, I just admire that you, you know, in both those stories, took the initiative to go and, and do that. And I think you have to, um, in being used by God in those spontaneous moments, I mean, I remember driving once on B470, and my tire just fell off my car. I mean, the craziest thing. And so I, I called AAA. No, is it AAA? Yeah, mm -hmm. AAA. I want to make sure it's AAA, not AA. Yeah. AAA. So I called AAA. That's a different <laughs> kind of different wheels kind, falling off the car. Yeah, different kind of ministry there. But anyway, so I, I called AAA, and they send this you know, guy out to change my tire. And he's like, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm only qualified to change tires. I'm not really qualified when they've fallen off. Wow. You know, I mean, you, you know, your, your tires are across the road, and I don't know what to do. I'm not qualified for this. So finally they send me a, a tow truck driver. And, man, this guy is a little scary, and I, I'm getting nervous thinking I'm going to have to climb up in the tow truck with him. So I get up in the tow truck with him. The car is obviously being towed behind, and, he has a plan. I don't, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I can't reach my husband, and he's the planner in car repairs. But anyway, I get, I get up in the tow truck, and, you know, we just have barely pulled out. And the guy says to me, do you believe that God loves everyone? <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, so this is, this is a God moment. You know, it's hard to rejoice when your tire's falling off your car, but this is a God moment. And I said, you know, I, I do believe that. And he begins to tell me the story of his life. And basically, he'd been married, um, had a violent temper, was caught up in alcoholism, and he beat his wife and ended up in prison. 
And I think what happens sometimes is if we respond to somebody else's sin in a negative way, and we're like shocked by what someone's done, or we're like, you've got to be kidding. How could you ever do that? Those ministry moments are lost. So my response to the man was, you know what? God loves you and he cares about you. But he wants you to repent. He wants you to repent of sin and enter into a relationship with him and believe him to change your life. And right there in the tow truck, I had the privilege of leading this man to Jesus. And I think God has that for all of us. I mean, he wants to use you. You know, he wants to use me. He wants to use everyone to impact our world. We just have to be obedient and recognize his leading. Yeah, absolutely. I think that point about we get hung up on people's sin so much when God overcame that, right? In, in Jesus, sin right. is overcome for everybody who will come to him. So that shouldn't be a problem for us. Yeah, it shouldn't yeah. be. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, tell, so all right, you're living here in Denver, or you're living up in the mountains. I'm living up in the mountains. We moved down to Denver. My husband switches uh, police departments, and we're living... Um, we're living in Denver. I'm working at a church. My husband's doing his job. And um, my husband comes to me and says, you know, Tony, I just think it's time that we, we buy property and we build a retreat facility for missionaries. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I, 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 well, I'm not going to say I was real gung-ho because living in the country, um, out east on the plains and the wind and yeah. thinking, oh my gosh, now now I live among the antelope. No, no humans, just antelope. <laughs> so anyway, we bought property and we built a retreat facility, and in the course of about, I don't know, seven, eight years, we housed 2,000 plus missionaries wow. from all over the world, and it was such an experience, yeah. such an amazing adventure of hearing people's stories of the great things that God's doing all over, all over the world. Well, okay, that's interesting. Tell, tell me about some of that. Like you, So you would have missionaries come to the to The retreat the facility, yeah. Okay. Um, they would come and stay. Sometimes they were just with us a couple days. We had one couple that was with us about a year, which was an unusual kind of thing. We weren't really set up for that. But mainly we pro- provided just a place of respite for them. We weren't a counseling center. We weren't, we weren't that kind of a center. People would just come. They'd relax. We'd have missionaries come, and, and they would stay in the room sometimes for a week, and we'd put food outside their door because wow. they were exhausted and, and just needed space. Yeah. Other missionaries would come and they'd be like, oh, you're going to Walmart? i got to go. I haven't <laughs> been there in several years. You know? But we, just, we did our best to just serve and, and help these people in their calling, you know, yeah. get them as healthy as they could be and back where God wanted them. Yeah. So. What did you find missionaries, or the ones that you interacted with, needed most? Um, I think they needed rest. Mm-hmm. And for the couples, I think they needed the ability to reconnect as a couple. Yeah. You know, serving God isn't for the faint of heart. And people who do ministry full-time and, and ministry is their livelihood, there are unique challenges that come with that. And some of those challenges include marriage and family. And so sometimes the, for couples, they just needed a place to be a couple. Yeah, you know? yeah I can see that. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Um, did you ever have a time where God felt distant or where you had a hard time with God? Uh, yeah, I, I think we've all had numerous of those, but <laughs> I think one of the hardest times for me was when, when we opened our retreat facility. Oh, okay. So is that um, my husband would tell you that, you that you could look on the road and see my, my handprints. <laughs> you know, my claw marks trying to just stay in, in Denver and not move, move out east. And that's a little bit true. A little bit true. <laughs> I wonder what those marks were. We drive out there. No, yeah, just, you'll just... have to look and just see. Um, I think it was challenging for me, um, partly because we, we purchased like 80 acres and, and we built a, a good sized home because we knew we were going to be housing people. But the culture was so different. Yeah. Um, the church culture was different. The, the way you interacted with neighbors was different. I mean, there was nothing familiar to me. And, you know, I think you, you move an hour from Denver out east, and not that much changes, but my whole world changed. Yeah. You know, I was working on staff at a church at the time and knew I needed to resign from my position. I mean, 
I was being ineffective living so far away, and it wasn't good for me. And so I, I'm leaving ministry, the things that are familiar to me, not knowing what I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, everything was just different. And I just felt like I complained a lot. I, I mean, I wish I could have said, man, I was just a trooper and had joy in God. And, but I complained in, in my heart and in my, with my mouth. And, and finally, I felt like God said to me one day, Tanya, are you unhappy with how I'm directing your life? And it was like a pivotal point where I began to repent. And my husband is a sweetheart of a guy, but he didn't pamper me. And what he said to me was, we agree that this is what God called us to do. And I know you're having trouble adjusting, but having trouble adjusting doesn't mean we turn our backs on what God's called us to do. We don't get a big disobedient and say, we're not adjusting well, so we're going to quit this and go back to life as it used to be. And there was a time, even in the midst of that, I, I had picked out a new house. I was ready to put our house on the market. I had the new house lined up. I was, I was ready to go. And there's a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament where the Lord speaks to his people and says, so are you going to plant vineyards for yourself? Are you, are you going to farm for yourself? Are you going to build big houses for yourself and not for me? And it was through scripture and my husband just saying, you know, basically he said, Tony, you're not a prima donna. You're a woman of God. And those are two different things. I love you and I treat you like you're a princess. But there's only so much I can do. You have to rise up and be the woman God created you to be. And embrace that calling. And it was a combination of those things that just got me back on the right path. Wow. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, so what okay, so I don't know when this is in your in your life, but so what happened then? What what did God do? Um, I think it began with a change in my heart. Okay. Um, I had to begin looking at things differently. And I have to tell you, I was in such a bad place that my husband recruited my parents. He recruited my parents to help me. And really, all that did was just make me mad. You (laughs) know? I mean, it just made me mad. And I'm like, I can't believe you called my mom and dad to come visit us to get me in shape. (laughs) So I'm picturing an intervention. (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of what it was like. Okay. And, you know, I I kept thinking. Tanya, we need you to sit down. I know. Can you? We got some things to say. And I kept, you know, and I kept thinking, well, at least my mom's going to sympathize with me. You know, I'm telling her, Mom, I just can't even stand it. The mud, you know, it was like May. The mud was everywhere. You know, I'd have to four wheel drive every place I went. The car was a mess. I was a mess. You know, I'm like, how can I look nice to go anywhere? You know, I got to wade through the mud. And I'm thinking my mom's going to be like, oh, sweetheart, it's so rough. <laughs> no, my mom says, okay, I'll buy you a pair of rubber boots. You just put those babies on when you leave the house. Carry your pretty shoes with you. And when you get there, you just take them right off. You'll be good to go, Tanya. Um, so it started with people not tolerating my complaining. Yeah. And, and God not tolerating my complaining. So it started with a change of heart. Uh-huh. And then it began with, I had once my heart began to change, I was able to begin to control my thoughts a little bit. Because you know when our hearts aren't right, mm-hmm. our mind goes wild. So I refused to allow myself to talk negative about where we lived, to talk negative about my husband. Because it, there was a part of me that was like, okay, this was Chris's dream. I know I agreed to this years and years ago, but I didn't know it was going to be like this. So I, I just got to the point, I refused. I'm not thinking negative, I'm not talking negative, I'm not letting that stuff be in my heart. And even my girlfriends, if I had a girlfriend that was just like overly like, oh my gosh, what has Chris done to you? I, I didn't have conversation about my struggles. And it was really a battle, an inward battle for me. And I kept thinking, okay, why am I in the middle of nowhere? You know, I mean, I love missionaries, I love God's people, but I, I'm just like in this place, you know, like my husband would go to work and the horses would get out and 
I'd be out there, you know, like running the fields, trying to catch the horses. We had mice, we had dogs, we had goats that were climbing on my car. And I'm thinking, this is not me, you know. But um, I loved the life, you know, before I moved to Africa. I thought, you know what, I'm just at peace with where we are and what God's called us to do. So it was an inward battle, and, and I think we all have that season. Yeah. you got, you got to change your heart, change your mind, press in, and do what God wants you to do. Right. And somehow in that discipline, discipline turns to joy. Yep. It doesn't happen overnight, but there's a process. So discipline goes to delight eventually. Right. Right, and you have to be willing to embrace the process. And, you do. And acknowledge where you are and just keep going every day. Yeah, yeah you absolutely. do. Absolutely. Interesting. Okay. So you said earlier that that kind of prepared you to go, well, leave the being in the mountains prepared you to go to South Africa. Yeah, but living out east really prepared me. I was going to say. Me, I, that, I'm telling you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it really prepared me. I had a much harder time adjusting from moving from Littleton out east than I did from moving out east to Africa. Uh, it was just yeah. much harder. I mean, we live in the bush, and it doesn't bug me at all. You know what? It's dirty. It's dusty, and it's fine. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, it just—I it, just don't get all hung up on that stuff anymore. Right. And um, yeah, it's just an amazing experience. I mean, I, my car got stuck in Africa a few weeks ago, and I couldn't remember um, exactly how to get it. It was my husband's car. I couldn't remember exactly how to get it in four-wheel drive. You have to, had to do something with the tires. So I thought, oh well, I'm, I'm just like a mile, mile and a half from home. I'll just, I'll just walk on home. Now, mind you, it's, it's dark outside, oh, you know. Man. And you know what? I, I wasn't scared. I wasn't intimidated, you know. I, I just walked on home, got Chris. We came back, got the car unstuck. And, and it was interesting. I, I walked home, and then when Chris and I were walking back to the car, we could see where a big snake had crossed right over where my footprint was on the path that I was walking. And you know what? I laughed about it. I didn't even, like, freak out. So... Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's a snake big enough to leave a track? Oh, big, big old track. And you know, I, I just, I Note to self. I don't know. I, I just wasn't even that, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just, it was like, okay, thank, thank you, Lord, that it wasn't there when I walked the path. But, you know. Wow. So. Okay, so fascinating how God prepared you uh-huh. and He knew how you would respond, right? So that. He got you ready out east here an um, hour so that you could go to Africa, which Definitely. is quite a bit further east of Littleton. Yes, quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, he really, he really did, you know. And, um, you know, you, you get out of, out of Denver, and I, I think that when we live in this city or people live in this city, we forget there's a whole other culture. Yeah. You know, there's cowboy boots and cowboy hats and... And country music plays at the grocery store, and people <laughs> rodeo on the weekends, and a whole different culture. But, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. Different cultures are interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but there's joy, and there's something good in, in them, too. It is. Experience. I was actually <clears throat> just recently doing a study in Isaiah where it talks about his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That, sure. That, I think it's Isaiah 9 6. And um, one of the, the definitions of some of the words within that passage says that God has created mankind, but he's also created people groups and he's created different cultures. Is that amazing? Yeah. So he's created all of these different cultures. He's, he's looked at that and it's not a random thing. He's created different systems right. of how people, you know, live yeah. life and find him and find each other. Yeah, I think there's something to that where you, can, if you look hard enough, you can see the image of God in people and in the ways they relate and the, and the cultures that they create um, all over, all over the world. And it, um, that is something that's really fascinating to, me, to try to look mm-hmm. for and try to see. Yeah. Um, anyway, I could go on for that on that for a long time, but we won't. Let's talk about your book. My book. Okay. Yes. So you. You're also a writer. I am, yeah. Um, okay, the book, I, I published a book last year called The Whispering of the Willows. And I think I mentioned earlier that both of my parents grew up in the Appalachian Mountains. Yeah. So the setting of the book is an area in West Virginia called Big Creek. It's just in the middle of nowhere. And my mom grew up there. 
My mom was one of 11 children. She was born in 1934, I believe. And um, they didn't have running water. My mom actually slept in a, in a shed. Wow. And especially in the summer. The clothes were washed in the creek. Um, and I was inspired to tell the story of those Appalachian Mountains. And so my book is a little bit different in that it's set in the 1920s. Um, and it's a coming of age story about a, a young girl named Emmy and the hardships of life and finding her way in the midst of poverty and strange and unusual beliefs of the Appalachian folk people and the hill people and um, how God takes the hardships of her life and redeems her. And there's this wonderful story of redemption, mm. how in the midst of devastating circumstances, God intervenes. So Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to read that. Oh, well, I hope you do. <laughs> now, my husband will tell you that it's, it's more of a girl book, but, you know, I think that's relative. <laughs> <laughs> good writing is good writing. <laughs> that's right. Writing. Yeah. So. Well, well, I was going to ask you how you, how you had the idea, but it sounds like it came through a lot of some of your story and then some of your, your mom's story. Definitely my mom's story. Yeah. Definitely my mom's story of, of what life was like for her and. Um, just, I don't know, um, my mom's clothes were made out of feed sacks. Wow. You know, um, she churned butter and milked cows and they raised uh, pigs and, you know, were as self-sufficient as they could be because there was no money. Right. You know, um, Christmas was an orange maybe. Um, so it's just very, very different. So. I, I took some of the stories from her childhood and pondered and thought about those stories. And, and my book is a, a work of fiction. But um, there are characters in the book that remind me of characters that I've met yeah. in the Appalachian Hills. Yeah, interesting. My dad goes uh, a couple times a year to Appalachia. Okay. And he'll do service projects there. So he'll help people with their house and he'll do, you know, one house had the like deck was just falling off yeah. so they figured out how to fix that up or they'll mm -hmm. they'll do other electrical stuff or whatever so i hear i've heard some stories of sort mm -hmm. of the it's a different kind of world it's a different, different it's a place. different kind of world and you know in the appalachians um at least when my mom was growing up people didn't leave mm -hmm. you know it was close family close community yep and stories were passed down from one generation to the next generation. And people stuck pretty close to home and they relied on community for yeah. survival. And, and in some ways, I think it's still a little bit like that from my relatives that still live there. Um, but it's just um, a beautiful, beautiful place. You know, the people are beautiful um, in spirit and kindness and um, I love that lives are so interwoven in those small communities. Cool. Um, all right. So two two more things. Okay. I want to hear the, the passage. We'll do okay. that last. And then you said that you had some interesting stories about your time in South Africa. Yes. And I want to hear <laughs> some of those. Okay. Um, my husband and I have been in South Africa for five years. And what we do is we come alongside other missions organizations and we come alongside local pastors and we help them sometimes with buildings or outreaches or educational programs, feeding programs, things that just give them a boost in the community. And so um, we've built churches and done all kinds of stuff and it, we're, it's just great. We're having a wonderful time. But um, there are a couple of things that have stuck out in my mind. Um, there are still a lot of witch doctors or Sangomas in South Africa. And I made friends with a witch doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if that's not a blog post, oh, yeah. you need you to write it. You know what, that it. would be great. That would be a great book title, too. I, I made, made friends, friends with a witch yes. doctor. That would be good. Okay, so she, she's a, she was a woman, and her name, the sign outside of her witch doctor office said, mm -hmm. Dr. Mama Joy. So she's always very friendly and waved. Now, we had some um, language barriers, but, you know, we, we got past the greetings and hi, how are you, you know. And um, 
God gave me a heart for this woman. And I began to pray for her. But I also began to pray against the deception. Because she had a sign outside of her store. I mean, she anything that was wrong, if you had a medical condition, if you had a problem with your love life, man, you could go to her and she could fix all this. Yes. And um, I began to pray, God, I'm asking that you close down this store, this doctor's office. Because people are coming here and they're paying hard-earned money. You know, sometimes they're taking money from their children's mouths and hopes of, you know, something different. And um, the office caught on fire. Now, Dr. Mama Joy wasn't in the office at the time. And the buildings on either side didn't even have smoke damage. Wow. So just her building, her, her little cubicle of, of sorcery, <laughs> was destroyed. And I, I know that my, Dr. Mama jo, Joy wasn't hurt. I haven't seen her since. But um, I, I know that God loves this woman and, and wants her, you know, to realize that strength, true strength comes from God, not from conjuring spirits, not from those kinds of things. So I thought that's a great story. Yeah. You know, that God just took out, took out that place of, of witchcraft and there's a sewing shop in there now. <laughs> More constructive. More constructive, yeah. So I, I think that's a great story. And another story um, I have is numerous times my husband and I have experienced God multiplying food. Mm. And Tell us about that. Okay. So we're, we're in, a, in a village in the middle of nowhere. And we've decided that we're going to do an outreach. We're going to you know, invite children in the village to come share the gospel and play games and face paint and do everything. And so we're thinking that we should maybe have about 200 children. That's what we're estimating. We ended up with over 500 children. Wow. And every child was fed. I don't know how it happened. We were feeding them hot dogs. I don't know how it happened, but the, the, the pot that we'd cooked the hot dogs in just, I don't know, that just more and more hot dogs just wow. never went dry. I think when we got done, we had one hot dog left. Did you get one? That... No. Oh. I, I probably wouldn't have eaten it anyway. Okay. <laughs> but you know what? I think um, God's still alive and yeah. wanting to do miraculous things. Yeah, that's fascinating. How, so how do you realize that? Like, Take me that moment when you were like, wait, there were a lot more kids uh, here than we had hot dogs. Well, first of all, I had to get a past the initial panic of what are we going to do? Yeah. What are we going to do? And, you know, we're, we're so far from anything. There's a little store, but they don't sell really anything um, that we could use. And so I just had to get past the initial panic, the initial fear of, you know, okay, if God doesn't supply, how am I going to explain these to the, these kids? Because that was a fear, you know. You know, these kids are very poor, and they've spent – their life fighting for food yeah. and how do we explain to them if we run out of food I'm sorry your friend got fed but you're not getting fed I mean you just can't do that so I had to get past that initial fear and of course um, Chris wasn't with me that day I was I was with a, a, a team but Chris wasn't there and so um, you know sometimes as a husband and wife you can cheer each other on and I just thought okay God I, you know I'm just I'm laying this down we're just gonna start feeding people and what happens, happens. And if we run out of food, I'm just going to believe you're going to give me wisdom to know what to do here. Never ran out of food. Never ran out of food. And that's the moment, right? When you yeah. said, okay, I'm just going to trust you and we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I, you know. And I think sometimes it's, it, for me, it's been easy to do that on African soil because the resources aren't there. I mm. mean, here in America... I could just run to the store. Oh, we've got 200 extra kids. I'm just going to go right down the road and, and buy hot dogs and buns, and it's going to be fine. Yep. Well, you know, in some places you can't do that. So it's either I can't fix this on my own. I can't just go buy more food. God, you have to supply. Yeah. So the same thing with the loaves and the fishes of bread. The fishes of bread. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the loaves, loaves of bread and the fish Yes. in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. I love hearing stories like that about how God has provided and that he, this is one of my favorite mm -hmm. things about having these conversations 
because I'm con- more convinced than ever that God is alive, He is active, and He is well, mm-hmm. and He is doing things. Uh, and if we just look, we just ask. We have no idea what He'll do. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Recently, um, I paid a I paid a visit to a, a young woman who was um, just in the last stages of AIDS, and you know, AIDS is a horrible disease. Mm-hmm. It's just a horrible disease. And I was sharing with the woman about the gospel, you know, and talking to her about asking Christ into her life. And she was telling me she would think about it, she would consider it, you know. And I left. Well, the woman died a couple days later. And I found out from the mother that the young woman asked Christ into her life. And not only did she do that, but before she died, she led the mother to Christ. Wow. And her last day or so was spent in the hospital. And the doctor told the family, we just, we can't even believe that she's still alive. We Mm. we thought she'd be gone several weeks ago. And I believe that God preserved this woman's life to hear the plan of salvation. And that not only did God preserve her life, for her to have eternity in heaven, but for her to lead her mom yeah. into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I think God's doing those things all over the world. You know, it just takes us being willing, yeah. you know, um, to serve him. I heard a message one time about when Jesus turned the water into wine. And the message was called, it's the servants who saw the miracle. It was the servants yeah. at the wedding. Well, that's good that took the containers and saw the water. They went and they filled the containers with water, right? Yeah. And the water turned into wine. It was the servants that saw the miracles. And you know, I think the same is true for us today. It's the servants of God who see the miracles. It's those, you know, when Jesus gave instruction, they listened to the instruction and filled the containers with water. Right. And that's what it's like for us. We listen to the instruction, we fill the containers with water, and we are privileged to see the miracles of God. Wow, that's great. I love that. Okay, anything else you want to share? Okay, I like your beard. Thanks. I do. I like your beard. It's been a pleasure meeting you. It's great to have you. Oh, thank you so much, Eric. Tanya, thank you so much for sharing your story. That uh, that was amazing, and I was listening to it and remembered when you said that uh, you'd found there was there was a snake track, so so a snake so heavy it left a, tr- a track. That just um, that that freaked me out a little bit. Again, actually, but anyway, that's uh, thanks for sharing your story. God's obviously done some amazing things uh, in your life and in the. The, through the people that you uh, you know, went out there to serve, um, you know, just by saying yes and trusting him, he showed up. I love that. That is the kind of thing I want to hear. Well, folks, if you uh, enjoyed this episode, would you do me a favor and just share it? Just go get get the link and uh, put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram, whatever works for you. I would love to have you uh, share this episode of halfway there and i know that uh that'd be great again you can get the book the whispering of the willows at ericnevins.com just go click the show notes for this page there's a link there makes it real easy for you and that's it so i hope you guys enjoy this episode we'll catch you next week keep the faith (laughs) 